Hi guys, I'm Darren and in this video we're going to take a look at the release candidate for iNav 7.0. So a couple of days ago iNav 7.0 release candidate 1 was released. It was kind of quiet but it was released on Thursday the 2nd of November and so I figured what I would do is just post up a video with a quick reminder about release candidates, what to expect, whether you should use them or not and you know what's actually going to be useful for you in this release. So first of all, release candidates are testing releases. So if you're not interested in bug testing or anything like that, then do not download the RC1. I made a video a while ago about the testing process and how to submit issues if you find them. And again, you will need to do this. It's part of a release candidate program. If you're going to be using it, if you find an issue, then report it through the right channel so it can be fixed. That's the whole point of the release candidate phase. It's not an early access so you can use new features and just enjoy it. There's a little bit of work that goes into it as well. So as I mentioned, 7.0 RC1 was just released. There will definitely be an RC2, maybe more on that. The stable release, probably about four weeks as an estimate but of course it could be sooner or later depending on what bugs are found and what work needs doing so let's head to github now this is where we can find the information about the releases so if you don't know there are two main github locations for iNav there is the firmware which is here and there is the configurator which i will just show you now which is here so we have github iNav flight iNav configurator github INAV flight, INAV. They are the two main repositories for INAV. So if you want to download and use RC1 or any of the following RCs, you need to go to the configurator GitHub. I'll put links in the description. Go to releases and at the top you'll find configurator 7 RC1. And what you'll do is just download the configurator from the assets and install it. If you're used to the XE version for Windows, we don't do the XE for the release candidates. You need to use the old method of using the zip files, extracting it and running it that way. But this is where you get hold of configurator from. And once you get your new configurator, what you would do is go to flash firmware, show unstable releases, and then you can choose the latest RC version. This is another point here. If you're using a release candidate version and a new release candidate version comes out, you do need to update. There will be bug fixes and changes in the update. And that's the, again, the whole point of this is to iron out any little bugs or problems so that the stable release is as stable as possible. If you hang around for four weeks on RC1 and then find a problem, it may have already been fixed in RC2 or RC3 or, or you know, whatever comes out in between. So you do need to make sure that you stay up to date. So that's why we would sort of recommend just flashing one or two planes or quads with the latest release candidate, not your whole fleet. Wait for the standard version for that. So before getting into a quick look at some of the stuff to watch out for, let's have a quick look at the release notes. So if you go to the iNav firmware GitHub, go to releases, and this time we're going to click on 7.0.0 RC1 because it just shows you a bit more information. And if you scroll down through this, I 100% recommend you do this anyway. Read the whole thing just to see what's new. There should be some potential issues. If we discover anything, we'll put it in these notes so you know stuff to avoid. But this will tell you how to do the update and the major changes. So let's have a quick look at the major changes. So first of all, there is this new flexible system for servo and motor allocation. Now this is sort of an answer to all the resource remapping stuff that people are used to with other firmwares. But because of timers, it's not really a good idea. So what iNav has done has actually allowed you to choose which timers you can use for different features. So you can see here we have timer one, timer three, timer four and timer eight. And they are also labeled here. So we have timer one, which you can see can do one thing. We have timer three, which can do four things. We have timer four, which can do two things. And timer eight, which can do two things again. So you can choose what you want the timers to do. So if we only had one motor, we could potentially say use timer one for the motors. 
and that would allow you to use uh, this just for motors and all this for servos. So it's a lot more flexible than it was. Again, it's not re resource remapping. You can't just say, I want a motor on S3, servo on S2, motor on S4, servo on S1. It, just, it doesn't work like that because of the timers. You have to follow those. But it does give you a lot more freedom in how you want to set up your flight controller. Again, what you need to do is pay attention to these labels, which will actually give you the output. So signal one, signal two, signal three, four, etc., And that will tie up to the signal on the flight controller. So that's basically what's happened here. So have a play. You may find that when you flash a target, you may have to move something because it has changed. Um, don't worry, it is just this new way of doing things. And it's actually got a few notes here. Right, so a big, big thing that's come to iNav 7 is VTOL support. Now, I'm not gonna go into VTOL because it is pretty in depth, but there are documents here that you can read to try out the VTOL stuff. If you're testing the VTOL, if you find a bug, check the issues to see if it's already been reported. There's a VTOL testing channel on the iNav Discord, or if you can't find any answers in either of those two, you can, of course, raise an issue. Next up, we have Easy Tune, which is a simpler way of tuning quads. This doesn't affect uh, fixed wing or any other platform. It is for multi rotors. And basically it lets you adjust the sliders to tune the quad. So again, this is something you'll need to read through to understand how it works, but it's a new feature that's in there. Next up, we have DMA Burst, which is something that will be more behind the scenes, but basically allows us to do things on certain channels that we couldn't before. So for example, the Matek F405TE and the SpeedyB F405V3, because of how the hardware was designed, we couldn't use D-Shot on certain channels because it didn't have DMA. This DMA burst mode now allows us to use some, sort, some form of DMA on those channels. So you can now use those flight controllers with D-Shot on the motor outputs as intended. Right, Jetty X bus has been fixed. There was an issue with the C compiler. This has been sorted out now. Multi-rotor cruise mode has been added, which allows you to basically pitch forward and then you know, keep cruising at that speed. Again, there's more information available in this YouTube video, so check that out if you're interested. NMEA protocol is no longer supported for GPS. To be honest, 99.9% .9 of the GPS modules in our aircraft can use U-blocks, so there's no real reason to use NMEA anymore. It's an old protocol. In the statistics, hardly anybody was using it. It's just taking up space. You can get for 12 quid a decent M10 GPS, which will support U-blocks. There's not really an issue here, but NMEA just is no longer supported. GPS improvements. So you can actually choose the clusters that you want to use now rather than just having Galileo. There's a caveat here. If the GPS only supports so many clusters and you choose all of them and it can't use those, it will just disable them again. So just make sure once you've saved it that they're still checked. And if they don't all save, then just don't set one of them. To be honest, you can see they're all in different regions, so they're not really going to be applicable everywhere. Uh, so just choose the ones best suited for you. Just as a quick note, if a GPS says it can support three clusters, you can't turn all these on. There is also a GPS cluster that is always on. So if your GPS can only support three clusters, for example, you'd only be able to turn on two of these. There is actually a uh, command you can change in CLI now, which will allow you to set the speed of the GPS module. It's a more advanced feature, but you, it means if you've got like an M10, you can put that up to sort of 23 Hertz or something like that. There'll be more documentation on how you can adjust that in the future. MSP VTX support. So this is really for sort of HD zero. If you want to update your VTX channel, you, it will now work through the MSP. So that's all good. Uh, so that's through the OSD menu, through the programming tab, or if you use ELRS backpack. Linear descent for return to home has changed. So if you are using this on, which basically if your RTH mode at the moment is at least linear descent, you will need to change that because it's no longer there. Quite simply, linear descent has been expanded. So it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. You can now use linear descent on any RTH mode. So if you're using the at least linear descent method at the moment, all you need to do is change that to just at least. 
then what you would do is enable the linear descent mode. And when you do this, you need to set a home altitude. It can be the same as your RTH altitude, depending on the RTH mode you've chosen. But the home altitude is now the target for the linear descent. So, for example, if you have a 100 meter RTH altitude and a 70 meter uh, home altitude and you're 200 meters in the air, when you enable RTH, if it's got linear descent enabled and the rest of the parameters are met, so let's say, for example, we're using at least. So uh, we're at least 100 meters because we're at 200 meters. What it will do is when you enable it, it will start descending so that when it gets home, it will be at 70 meters, which is the home altitude that we set. Also, you can set how far away from home it will start doing the descent. This is set in meters and it's up to 10 kilometers. So for example, let's say we set it to one kilometer. We're one and a half kilometers away at our 200 meters. When we hit RTH, it will fly back half a kilometer and then it will start descending to the 70 meters. So that's how the new system works. And again, the wiki has been updated to go into this in a little bit more detail. Next up, we can now have pilot logos. And again, there's a new OSD document that goes into this in a bit more detail. And basically it allows you to have your pilot logo on an arming screen or your pilot logo as a little icon on your OSD anywhere. And to do this, you will need to modify the fonts. So it's not going to be for everybody, but anyone who's done any font editing before or is looking to get into it, it's not actually that difficult, but this will allow you to have a pilot logo. So they're the main changes. There are a couple of other little uh, changes of note. So auto level has been renamed auto level trim. It does exactly the same thing. It's just the parameter it edits is called fixed wing level trim. So this is auto level trim. And it's tr to try and separate it from the idea of auto level, as in you let go of the sticks and it levels, which of course is horizontal angle mode. So it's just a name change to try and make it a bit more clear. The OSD milliamp hour used precision CLI parameters change. You just need to get rid of the used underscore and it will still work. This parameter isn't just for the used milliamp hours anymore. It also affects the remaining milliamp hours, which has also been changed so that you can use more than 9,999 milliamp hour packs, which was the limit before. It, obviously you could use a higher pack, but you couldn't really show any more higher than that on the OSD. So that's changed. Again, the 24 channels for Jetty, which doesn't work on F411 or F722. And the virtual PITO is enabled by default now because it's been working pretty well. FreeSky D telemetry is no longer used, but who's been using that for ages now. And the output mode has been removed because we have this nice new mixer setup. We don't actually need that output mode anymore. So they're the things to, uh, to be aware of when you do this change. Another couple of things that I would mention, and let's pop into configurator. So I've literally just flashed 7.0 on here um, and just brought my settings over from the last model. And one thing that we do need to check if we're fixed wing, uh, because of the VTOL changes, motor stop on idle has will default to off now. So we need to turn that back on for, fi for our fixed wing and save and reboot. Uh, but other than that, I've not actually noticed anything else that we really need to be concerned about. Everything else just seems to copy over just fine. But make sure you do enable that motor stop on low throttle for fixed wing if you're bringing in a diff from an old uh, release. Just to have a quick look at this mixer, you can see this is a different flight controller. We have timer four here with four outputs and all the other timers have two. So by default, they'll all be set to auto, which is how basically it worked originally anyway. So on our auto, we have, uh, that's gonna be motors and they're all gonna be servos. Auto on fixed wing and multi-rotor will be different. So if it's a multi-rotor, probably timer two and timer five will automatically be motors and the rest will be uh, servos. But you can just specify which you would like them to be. But for the most part, you won't actually need to touch it. Just leave it on auto and it will all be good. Right, so I've shown you where the new release is. I've shown you how to do the update. I've shown you what new features there are. I've shown you a couple of things to watch out for when you do the update. I guess the only other thing that I should mention is reporting if you do find a bug. Back in the internet, 
obviously the bug reporting can be in one of two places. So if you actually find a bug in configurator, so for example, we have EasyTune here, but the platform is aeroplane. You can't use EasyTune on an aeroplane, so that really could be hidden. So if that was an example of a bug, you would go to the INAV configurator GitHub and create an issue in here reporting that. Any other bugs that aren't related to just the way the configurator works or displays information would usually be reported in the firmware. So again, you would report that in the INAV repository and the bug here. And it'd be worth noting INAV 7RC, whichever RC you're using. So that would be where to report the bugs. And I'll put a link, as I said, to the video where I go over bug reporting and how to write a nice, effective bug report that gives us information rather than just saying X doesn't work, but that doesn't really help. So that's how to report issues. Again, all the links will be in the description. I think I'm gonna leave it there. So anyone who's interested in 7.0 RC1 can have a play. Basically, it's the time to play. Don't expect it to be perfect, though it is pretty good because developers have been flying with 7.0 or some sort of instance of it for quite a while now. When 6.1 was released, then everything after that was 7.0. So all that time that people have probably been flying 6.1 the developers have been flying you know some form of 7.0 so it's not like everything's going to fall out the sky and die but there are a couple of things that could cause an issue but so be aware of that this is a testing release and if anything goes wrong just make sure that you are doing everything possible to make that situation as safe as possible but there's the information hope you enjoyed the video Fly models like you stole them and have fun. See you on the next one.